those of you who don't know me, I'm Nicola Kays um, from AUT University. Um, so I'm chairing this next session and this next session is focused on equity and attending to the needs of those most at risk. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker who works with Mona Jeffries, who you've already worked from at the Heringa Waka Victoria University of Wellington. Um, Lynn um, is unfortunately our second speaker, speaker Mariana, who um, was going to bring a Pacifica perspective to the symposium today is not able to join us. And so Lynn is going to have a slightly extended session. And I just wanna acknowledge that we will um, try and work with Mariana and others and see if we can get um, a presentation online after the fact. So welcome Lynn, um, over to you. Uh, tēnā te mohiki a koutou katoa, uh, ko ai au, um, huri tēnei o ngā tikahungunu, um, kaitahu rangi tāne uh, me ngā te parau, ko Lynn Russell tōko ngā uh, tēnā koutou. Uh, I'm speaking to you today about um, some of the preliminary findings of the study that um, Mona has just flagged, um, which amongst other things looked at the impact of long COVID on Māori. Um, uh, the study, as you know, I, I'm just going to repeat a couple of things on the off chance that people might have jumped in to listen to Tangata Whenua um, uh, stories of long COVID. So the study is um, Ngā Kawi Kawi o Mate Corona, looks at the impacts of um, COVID on people who contracted it in Aotearoa before December 21. Um, it's a, a mixed method study, so involved both the survey, has involved both the survey and qualitative interviews. Um, in the interest of time, I'll try not to repeat too much of Mona's korero, um, but just to explain that of the 373-odd respondents to the survey that, that the prelim kind of analysis has been um, done against so far, 65 were Māori, and as Mona said, of them, 75% reported ongoing symptoms of COVID, uh, over three months later, so, you know, long COVID. And over 30% of those Māori reported they had experienced depression and anxiety uh, as some of that symptomology. In terms of the impact of their daily lives, over 45% of them reported long COVID symptoms that had had a moderate to extreme impact on their usual activities. Those are not insignificant, either of those issues. Again, Mona has shared some of this, but just to quickly uh, recap what this is saying about, about Māori, what the survey data is so far telling us about the challenges Māori with long COVID are facing. Over half said that they were scared, that they didn't know what to do next, didn't know when that, that this was going to end or who to go to for help. And when they did seek support, almost half didn't feel listened to. Around a third found that their doctor either didn't provide the support that they needed or didn't refer them on to anyone, and perhaps because they themselves didn't know what to do next. And these findings are backed up by the qualitative evidence that has come through um, the interviews, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. So uh, we had 36 Māori who indicated that they wanted to tell their story um, and, and have ended up um, with a potential group there of around 28. Um, of these 28, 17 have, have ongoing symptoms of COVID. And today I'm speaking about, uh, I'm gonna to speak to only 10 of those interviews. We're, we're still in the, um, the, the early, we're still in the midst of this research. So, you know, we have some transcript stats and we don't have some transcript stats. So I'll, I'll speak to about 10 interviews of the 17 that we've interviewed so far, Māori who have uh, long COVID. Um, and from our very preliminary analysis to date, the things that I'll touch on are some of these common themes that seem to have arisen from the interviews with Māori. Um, people, uh, feeling surprisingly sicker than ever before, surprisingly, because maybe, um, you know, this is all the unknown. Uh, questions about what this means for them now, particularly around the identity, who am I now, the changes that have happened in their lives, changes that have occurred through having long COVID. Um, this thing about um, not being sure whether uh, the symptoms of long COVID are actually because of long COVID or, or because of 
the many other possible illnesses they, they already have, uh, why their doctor won't take them seriously, and what they can actually do about this. So um, I do have a lot of quotes. I kind of apologise and I kind of don't. Um, so the ongoing symptoms that Marty described were all those you would have heard before. Uh, the difficulty um, in breathing, brain fog, loss of smell and taste, chronic fatigue. These quotes come from just two of the wahine, but they're not that atypical. Um, you know, people saying things like, I'm still not well, I'm pretty sure it's affected my liver, I can't do alcohol, I can't exercise, I get migraines and headaches constantly, I battle fatigue, brain fog, like it's still all there. Um, uh, and and, and, and and then being affected when illness comes in again, not having the kind of uh, the ability to kind of find fight off things like colds. This quote, quote comes from a 70 year old Komatua um, who caught COVID in 2020. Both he and his wife uh, ended up with it and then uh, ended up with long COVID, although they did. Um, deduce or diagnose this themselves um, once their symptoms did not go away, which is not also not that uncommon. He talked a lot about the impact on his wife of 47 years and his concern about her, her difficulties in breathing now. He also spoke a lot about missing the food that he loves because he can't taste it anymore and why that was important for him as a, as a Māori. Um, I'll, I'll just read it even though you can see it. We both got long COVID and we still um, got some bad side effects from it, but she's probably the worst. She plays golf and we used to walk 18 holes. She can't do that anymore. We're staying in a hotel and she carried a chair from one room around the corner to our room and she was absolutely knackered by the time she got in there. I didn't realise how bad it was until I saw that. So she's still suffering from major respiratory problems. I have things like cough, sneezing, fuzzy brain, not remembering um, things that uh, I remember place. I, I just can't quite get it. I can't find the words. The biggest issue for me is smell and taste. After two years plus, I still haven't got my smell and taste back properly. It's annoying because food's part of life and you don't um, you just don't get that enjoyment out of it anymore. I'm afraid the Māori comes out in me when it comes to my food. I enjoy my food as part of your life. And, and we know the significance of kai uh, beyond the taste and, and um, enjoyment of kai. It's important uh, for us and many things. Others also described quite dire changes in lung functioning. Wahine, uh, I'm sorry if you can hear my clock chiming in the background. One wahine Māori who ended up um, on a respirator for 10 days, she really was quite ill when she had COVID and now has ongoing uh, chest x-rays, described uh, what it was like being shown her x-rays in the chest clinic uh, from the time when she had been rushed into hospital. And she talked about um, this change in x-rays within a 24-hour pe period where her lungs became clouded. They were like clouds coming across. The, and she described the dark patches as where the air couldn't get in. And she showed them to her husband, who also was astonished. And, and, the, and um, they said how grateful they were that they didn't know it at the time. Although she has significantly improved, her latest chest, chest x-rays also still show that degree of damage. Prior to getting COVID, this wahine uh, was extremely active. Again, not an uncommon story. Um, but now she suffers from extreme fatigue and sleep apnea, something that was never part of her life before. She used to be able to run on a treadmill two or three times a day. Can't do that at all now. Um, and that, those kind of changes, uh, that example of change has very much affected her sense of self in terms of having to adjust to a new reality, a new identity. Um, things that how she knew herself before is not how she knows herself now. In our research, um, that theme has come up quite a bit, that altered sense of identity has been highlighted with people, uh, where many of those with long COVID now question, who am I? What is my role now? Um, and that identity change can also relate to mahi, as seen in that second uh, wahine's quote there. Those who, um, how long COVID has changed their whole work lives and their role in employment 
and for some uh, also means a loss of income. Um, um, should I read that? Yeah, I'll read it. I was reduced to five hours a week. I couldn't handle anything more than that. I struggled even with that and would pass out for the rest of the day after I'd worked my hours. I, I quite brain drained stuff and it was really taxing my, on my head so I could concentrate for that really short period of time, but I would be absolutely had it after that for the rest of the day. That And that reduced my income. I'd love to extend my, work, my hours, but currently I can't handle it. Yeah, again, not an uncommon story. So an, a significant impact of long COVID is on identity, how people see themselves, who they once were, were uh, and who they no longer are in all many, many different ways. We know that um, Māori disproportionately shoulder an increased burden of the vast majority of commonly diagnosed morbidities and at earlier ages. And in particular, we know through research that these disparities include a greater prevalence of conditions that may exacerbate the, the impact of COVID-19, such as chronic pulmonary liver and renal disease. A number of the participants with pre-existing comorbidities indicated that they didn't know where, whether the symptoms of long COVID that they, they were now experiencing were in fact symptoms of long COVID, or whether it was just the ongoing illnesses flaring up or playing up. Um, you know, like this woman said, I had this ongoing cough, but I, but I, well, that was meant to say I didn't go to the doctor because I wasn't sure um, whether it was long, whether it was long COVID or not. Um, this again was a comatoa. I get fatigued, but I'm getting older too, so I've sort of put it against that a little bit, and I still get aching joints, and again, but I'm I'm getting older, sneezing all the time, but we just put that down to hay fever. It's a bit of a fine line trying to figure out which side of the fence you fall on. Is it age or is it long COVID or is it something else? I don't know. For this grandmother uh, with a history of COPD um, who made contact with our study, finding out about this thing called long COVID was a real eye-opener and it provided bits of sense-making in the puzzle for her. Again, I don't think this is uncommon. She realised that when she was really crook a couple of years ago, or when her and her 13-year-old Muko were really crook, that it must have been COVID, but she never got tested. And I think Mona or someone mentioned this earlier on. Um, so never tested for COVID, but were both extremely unwell. Um, they also shared a bed um, quite often. Um, so she ended up not being able to walk, not being able to speak even. And since then has had multiple health issues. And she described her muko, um, like not being herself as well, and her muko describing uh, herself like in that same way that she did, hadn't felt like herself. And um, for this uh, nanny, being able to place what had, what had been happening for them over the last couple of years within this, this context of something that she hadn't heard about before, it was a relief in a way. Particularly in regard to Moko, I thought she said the Moko was foggy and I can't quite see my screen and all that kind of stuff as well. And they thought she was naughty and lazy and everything else, but she had long COVID. Yeah, that was important for her to, to, to recognize that this wasn't about her, her Moko being naughty and lazy. She was just croc. Um, the grandmother also spoke of not being believed. Again, not an uncommon, unfortunately, not an uncommon uh, story at all from our um, Māori storytellers. Not being believed by the health professionals as she tried to talk about long COVID. And one of the, uh, she suggested that because she never got tested for COVID and therefore she had no formal record of ever having it, she felt like that, that was possibly why her doctor disregarded any possibility of long COVID and it made her feel like a hypochondriac. I'm hoping you can, you've read that fast enough because I'm gonna flick on. This Komata and his wife, um, it was hard reading their transcript to be honest, uh, have similarly been dismissed by their doctors in regard to their very clear long COVID symptoms. Um, and he, you know, they just look things up themselves. 
and and tried to figure it out. But when they each time on more than one occasion when they when they spoke to the doctors plural about it, they have been totally disregarded. What's worrying about this in particular are the other long term conditions that both have. So the Karawa has type two diabetes and heart disease, and his wife has COPD. And there's, uh, he, he was very clear that there is no interest at all from either doctor in entertaining any idea of long COVID, even though the two of them quite clearly see themselves in this camp. Um, I think this is, okay, other, others told of similar reactions from GPs, but also and having to fight for support, but this mama, this quote is a good one. Um, she spoke of knowing that this is basically, essentially this is a normal reality for Māori in primary health care and in health care. And one that she was well used to, uh, one that she was well used to resisting and one that she would uh, resist again. So I like this. I think we should read it. I ended up going a couple of times because when you feel that crappy, it's like surely you can offer me some kind of relief. I had every symptom under the sun, every symptom. It went on for six weeks. And so I knew I needed something. I knew that I can't breathe properly. Give me a bloody inhaler. Give me something. Let me try something. And I've always been pushy like that because actually I know that Māori in the medical system, it doesn't work for us. And so we need to push for what we need. And I've always known that. I've got a lot of whānau who are nurses, nurse practitioners. And so I've always known if you want to get something and you're not getting the service you need, you need to stand up for yourself. Others, though, we just, just... We just need to round things up. Sorry, Lynn. Okay, I have got two slides, three, two slides to go. Other people spend a lot of time and energy doing their own research, seeking out their own solutions. A corridor from Janine this morning would have emphasised this. This is another case in point. I won't read it, but you, but you know the story. Um, but basically, most people with long COVID... And most Māori with long COVID, they just want answers like everyone else. They want to know what's happening to them, what can be done to help them. They talk of being scared of the unknown. Uh, they want to be heard and believed. I've only presented some of our very early looks through the transcripts that we've been through so far, but you'll see that these are common themes. The experience of contracting COVID, experiencing all that has meant over the last two years, including isolation from whānau, absence from tangihanga, fear of death, changes in identity, immense uncertainty, increased hardship and massive stress has left Māori who have gone on to, uh, to develop long COVID and with many, many questions needing answers. And this research hopefully is, is going to do some, uh, go some way to help filling some of those gaps alongside the rest of your work. Kia ora koutou. Nā mihi noi, Lynn. Thank you so much for sharing, sharing those stories. Um, so I'm going to move straight on to our next speaker, um, Paula Tesserero from the New Zealand Disability um, Rights Commissioner. Um, so um, welcome, Paula. I don't know if you have slides to share, but please, I'm going to hand over to you. So, inga mana, inga reo rauranga tēra mā tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Paula Tesserero tōko ingoa, ko o te kaihutu, te kahoatanga, Mō te kāhui, te kitangata ki Aotearoa nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for inviting me to this really important discussion and to provide a disability and human rights perspective on long COVID and its implications. My role as Disability Rights Commissioner is a statutory role set up under the Human Rights Act to uphold and protect the rights of all disabled people in Aotearoa. These rights are covered by domestic laws, including the Human Rights Act, the Bill of Rights Act, as well as a number of international human rights instruments, such as the UN Convention, on the rights of persons with disabilities, as well as, of course, in Aotearoa, those rights needing to be consistent with Te Tiriti o Waitangi. The right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health has existed since 1946, and it's been articulated since then in a range of international conventions and treaties. The right to health 
is a fundamental part of our human rights framework and our understanding of what it means to have a life in dignity. And that important right to health is linked to our ability to enjoy many other rights and freedoms that we have as citizens in Aotearoa. A strong commitment to Te Tiriti o Waitangi should also be at the forefront of our minds to create conditions for tangata whaikaha Māori and their whānau to express the rangatiratanga that allows them to meet their aspirations and needs. The human rights that I very briefly touched on, and in the interest of time, it's only very brief, we might all expect to enjoy that right to health, participation in decisions that affect us, access to information provided in ways that we can all understand, as well as for reasonable accommodations or modifications that allow us to work on an equal basis with others or live safely in our homes. But actually, the way that society is set up and the negative attitudes to disability mean we don't get to always enjoy these rights and inequities. And in fact, those inequities continue to get baked into the system. And as Lynn alluded to, they keep further baked in for tangata whai kaha Māori and other marginalised groups. The pandemic, as we know, has exacerbated the gaps and the responses to date has certainly not always benefited or taken into account the needs of disabled people. And make no mistake, my strong view is that long COVID for many people absolutely meets the multiple definitions of disability that we have, both articulated domestically through the Human Rights Act, through Ministry of Health information and eligibility criteria for disability support services, and it most certainly meets the international definition around disability, which is cushioned in the social model of disability, which I'll talk about very shortly. Some of you may know I recently released a report following an urgent inquiry that I undertook into how disabled people and their whānau have been impacted by the Omicron response, which confirmed that people have been disproportionately impacted, affecting both their trust and engagement in the response. I'm concerned that this may not bode well for how people with long COVID are fearing now or in the future in our current health and disability system. People with long COVID symptoms are already, as we know, sharing in Aotearoa and internationally experiences and concerns that echo what people with other chronic health conditions tell me in my role every day. Chronic health conditions like ME, other health conditions, rare disorders. People have talked about significant barriers that they face. And there's some links to some stories in the PowerPoint slide there. But in my engagement with these groups, they report significant issues like they feel they're not believed by health professionals or employers when they talk about their long COVID, uh, or in this case, long COVID symptoms, and in other cases, ME and other chronic fatigue type uh, issues. They are often not recognised in the health system where there's a lack of expertise and understanding of the latest evidence and research. Employers are not always responding as flexibly as they need to continue to work and manage their symptoms. People have a lack of access to clinical trials. There are barriers to accessing medicines and assistive devices. There's a lack of bespoke supports and access to flexible disability and other supports. And really importantly, there's a lack of prevalence data and expectations that are then put on community to somehow show that prevalence and gather that and devise all of the solutions on their own. Those issues are embedded in a system that also relies on diagnosis alone rather than an assessment of what supports people might need. In fact, that was cited as a real issue in the review of the health system and the consequent reforms. 
Many of those barriers that I talked about, I know are barriers that people with long COVID are facing. The spin-off from the lack of recognition in the health and disability system rolls into a number of effects. In a nutshell, that means discrimination and it results in further inequities in our system. Understandably, many people with chronic conditions like long COVID are frustrated, unwell, and may well need support to advocate for their rights. So it's really critical there are avenues for complaints, such as the Human Rights Commission, the Health and Disability Commission, the Ombudsman's Office, but most importantly, the systems and cultures with those systems must change. I'm gonna skip the next slide in the interests of time. And I've been given a um, message to start to wrap things up. So I want to acknowledge the many stories and evidence and articles that are coming out talking about long COVID having a really disabling impact on people and that it, it will become one of the current generation's disability challenges. I agree. And we've got to have some courageous conversations about this. You may have heard of the social model of disability, which is in sharp contrast to the medical model, the medical model which relies on diagnosis and it relies on challenging people for their own individual impairment rather than the systems and structures that we have in place. We don't talk about ableism in New Zealand and how we treat people who are disabled or have chronic health conditions but we need to because those negative attitudes and stigma are one of the biggest barriers we face. And we know, and I had a slide on it, but I, I will skip across it because I think Lynn beautifully articulated the particular challenges for tangata whaikaha Māori and the particular challenges and barriers that Māori face in accessing the health system. So in conclusion, from a disability rights perspective, what's needed if we're going to help and support the growing number of New Zealanders who experience long COVID to navigate the future is a really courageous conversation about the protection of human rights, about long COVID and the ongoing supports people need. We will need a strategy to back that up. We'll need a change in attitudes to disability and disabled people and those with chronic health conditions. We need a commitment to equitable practice and policies so that those with long COVID are not left behind. And we must have a human rights and a te tariti based approach that supports equity and dignity. Nā mihi nui, kia koutou katoa. Nā mihi, Paula, thank you so very much. And I'm really sorry that we have to move on so quickly. Um, we're running a little bit behind time in this session. And so I'm hoping that um, Gillian Raywin um, can help bring us home to finish it off really nicely. Um, so I'd like to invite our next speaker, um, Jilly Sinclair, um, to join us. Um, Jilly is from the Auckland City Mission. No my Heidi, my Jilly. Kia ora. Thank you so much for having us and giving us an opportunity to discuss the um, our vulnerable population and the impact of long COVID. Um, my name's Jilly and this is Mel Barry. We're switching screens so that you don't need to sit too close so we reflect COVID distancing perfectly. Um, I'll provide a brief status quo and then Mel will discuss the impact of long COVID on our street far now. The Calder Centre provides health care to um, Aucklanders most vulnerable populations for people in desperate need. Homeless people experience poor and irregular access to healthcare. They have significant unmet health needs, delays in clinical presentations, and a really high use of emergency departments. Premature mortality results from a complex combination of medical conditions often related to severe and chronic comorbidities and the consequence of social exclusion shaped by homelessness. Rough sleepers die 30 years earlier than their housed counterparts. 10 years of rough sleeper deaths reviewed by New Zealand coroners indicated that the average um, mean age of death was 45.7 years and the average death of suicide was 36 years. Suicide was involved in nearly a third of the deaths 
and about 20% were motor vehicle accidents and other accidents. About three quarters of the deaths were considered amenable to timely and effective healthcare intervention, which they didn't receive. 34% of the, sorry, 75% of the homeless population, sorry, 34% of the homeless population um, committed suicide, that committed suicide had no mental health connections. If they did, it was within the past year and very few of them had ongoing engaged services and care. Um, Australia has identified that of the 11% of sorry, of the people presenting to their homeless services, 11% identified they had health need. When they were assessed, 73% they had significant mental health issues and 39% had incredible medical issues, none of which were identified by the street whanau. This is just a, a comparison between homeless and house people and our presentations available later on, but it just demonstrates the significance of some of the comorbidities and concerns. Um, the Quarter Centre works in a trauma-informed care philosophy with maximum inclusiveness. We really understand our population and their needs and work to establish services that work for the population. One of our big barriers is funding to deliver the model in a trauma-informed care manner so that we can address some of those huge unmet needs. And just a little example of how we can do things better and differently was during COVID over a 10 week period, we approached the street whanau 50 different times. We did nearly a thousand vaccinations, 1200 swabs, and it resulted in 84% of the street whanau being vaccinated. So, I mean, there, there are cool ways of doing it if we could do it a bit differently. Hello. Um, I'm now. Um, I am new to the Calder and Auckland City Mission, so this is all new thing for me as well. Um, COVID in our street far now, um, we have had a huge impact as far as I can see going into COVID and even coming out the other end of it. Um, the research obviously is still coming out about how the impact of not just COVID but long COVID is on all of our populations. Um, our street by now, as is outlined, has huge comorbidities that go in there. And they're not just mental health and physical health. There's so many different things that have made a huge difference. Um, not only are they increased risk of catching COVID, but they're also more likely to have adverse reactions and adverse um, outcomes coming out of it on the other end. People experiencing homelessness are more often with a lower life expectancy. They've got major health stuff going there. That is going unrecognised. So call the centre's mission is to be able to breach those barriers that we have, whether that's going to them out in the street, whether that's going and finding homes and things for them. Um, they have found that COVID for our street population um, they did some research that was looking at not just the people experiencing homelessness, but also people that were experiencing institutionalised um, our prison populations. So they found that people coming from prison and um, homeless situation were presenting more frequently. Although the stays in hospital for COVID were shorter, they were actually representing with, with symptoms at a prolonged period afterwards, which is kind of indicating the, the impact that long COVID is having on our populations. Um, lack of sleep, malnutrition, stress, all of these things weaken our immune system. And our street population in particular have got these on a daily basis. So it's COVID is just another thing that they have that they have to deal with. So it's not kind of up there on their to-do list, to be honest, um, which is one of the reasons why they don't present. Um, um, obviously, risk factors go in there as well. I mean, stay at home when you're sick, wash your hands, talk to your medical doctor. All of these things they don't have. So how are they going to be able to do that? So they have found that, that the challenge of what those were was trying to be able to make, meet those needs. So lack of housing, access to healthcare, um, lack of drive to be able to access it. These were all things that they just didn't do. So they just sort of lived with it. So going out of it as well, um, long COVID symptom wise, they're still just living with it because it's it's just not up there. Um, closure of all of those public facilities meant that they couldn't meet those needs, um, which, which most people find simple. Um, so the heightened risk of chronic illnesses, mental health, um, and, and of course the younger population that are coming 
into the um, street barnyards means that they are going to be having multiple representations into ED, um, if anything, just to have somewhere to stay. Um, we just need to round things up if you can. Thank you. Um, with the constraints of the travel, it means that mental health is actually cracked up as well, which is really also impacting the um, result of the economic changes. They don't have work when they normally would. A lot of their income, so all of these things are actually going to impact them going out of the other end as well, which means that they're not going to have as easy access. So our role at Call the Centre is to try and breach as many of those as we can. Homelessness is not a trait, it's just something that we need to go with. It is an amendable to intervention. So since the lockdown, there's been some good things that have come out of it as well. So a lot of our street farmers have been found homes, so they've been put into warm housing. So there have been some good strategies that have come into play. We just need those to continue coming out the other end as well. So um so Auckland City Mission obviously has contributed towards providing ongoing supports, not just through the lockdown. So some of the things that they've done, they've done through parcels, they've continued, they've still done welfare checks. Um, we've got a really good relationship with the managed isolations at the moment, which means that our, all of our positives that we are checking and we are routinely screening have been put into a safe environment where they can recuperate. Um, medications are another thing that they have also been sort of continuing so some things that we can continue to help and identify our long COVID is um, increasing surveillance screening, just not just for the fact that they've got symptoms, because most of them don't have symptoms going into COVID. It's just afterwards that they have those continued prolonged issues. So reducing those contacts would also reduce the spread, um, increased rates of homelessness means that they can potentially be exposed to others as well and the coping mechanisms change as a result of it. Wider services integration, so having a really good transparent process and a really good transparent relationship has meant that we've been able to provide a care and, and continue to have that trust where we've not actually been as forward focused as we, we would previously be. Um, and obviously funding to continue, not just in the pandemic, but also in health. So that is me. Awesome. Thank you so very much, both of you, for bringing the voice of Street Fano into this symposium. I think it's a really critical voice that we often don't hear from. So thank you. So last but not least, um, I would like to invite Raywin um, Gavin, who is from Starships Children Hospital in Auckland. Welcome, Raywin. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, I'm uh, Dr. Owen Gavin, paediatrician from Auckland, uh, here to talk briefly about long COVID in young people. So fortunately, we are starting to get some prevalence data through now um, for young people, uh, which um, also includes matched controls. So from the UK, the UK Office for National Statistics undertook a very wide schools infection survey in the UK in November and December 2021. Fortunately, we also have reached consensus on a, a diagnosis, a diagnostic criteria for long COVID in children now, which is having a po positive COVID test, continuous symptoms for 12 weeks or more, and symptoms that significantly impact everyday life, including physical activity, learning, and emotional well-being. So this uh, school survey, uh, when they looked at the primary school age population, um, about a quarter of children who had had a positive COVID test still had three or more recurring symptoms 12 or more weeks after their positive test. When they looked at uh, children who hadn't had a positive COVID test, 20% of them also had three or more recurring symptoms at that time point. But overall, of the uh, primary school age children, 1% met diagnostic criteria for long COVID, whether or not they'd had a positive COVID test. When they looked at secondary school uh, students, the numbers were even higher. So um, a third of patients, a third of our students still had uh, three or more recurring symptoms at the 12 week point after having a positive test and a slightly lower, but not statistically significantly different number of those who hadn't had a positive test. So of the whole secondary school um, group, it was 2.7% who met the diagnostic criteria for long COVID. Um, 
So less than adults, but still a significant proportion of the population. When they looked at the specific symptoms that were ongoing, they were um, a lot of the ones that had already been described by previous people. The only symptom that was significantly different in the COVID group was loss of uh, smell and taste. There is going to be very soon, we hope, some really good quality data coming out of the US uh, from their Recover study, which is a prospective study into long COVID launched in June last year by the National Institute of Health. This uh, importantly includes data on vaccination status and which COVID variant is involved. And really importantly for us includes children and young people. Um, and so they will be finishing recruiting in June and hopefully it won't be too long before we get some data from there. What about Australia? We keep in close contact with our Australian colleagues. Like us, they had seen relatively low numbers of referrals for long COVID to paediatric clinics in 2020 and 2021, but numbers are starting to increase now. Uh, most centres in Australia looking after um, young people with long COVID are managing them in pre-existing chronic fatigue syndrome clinics, but point out that most of those clinics are significantly chronically underfunded. And importantly for New Zealand, there are no uh, paediatric um, specific chronic fatigue syndrome clinics in the public se sector that I'm aware of. So risk factors for children uh, going on to develop long COVID include um, being female, uh, being in the older age group, so that's adolescents, having poor baseline physical or mental health and having pre-existing asthma. Um, so people, Anna and others, have spoken before about comparisons with long COVID and ME-CFS. Is it the same disease? Uh, we don't really know yet, but there is increasing evidence that the, the post-viral processes, the cellular disruption, the immunological changes um, are probably different, are probably similar, but with a different viral trigger. And as mentioned, the main differences are um, increased, altered, taste and smell and more shortness of breath following COVID compared to other viruses. And as has been pointed out before, that overwhelming fatigue, particularly post-exertional fatigue, is a hallmark symptom. So what do we do? As everybody else has said, you have to believe the patient. They are the one with the symptoms. Um, as paediatricians, we need to uh, check for other conditions that may present in a similar way. Um, and also think about preventing further harm, which may be direct or indirect, um, from ongoing social isolation, changes in uh, access to education, further deconditioning um, and medical complications. So in summary, the, pa the pandemic has had a profound effect on all young people, regardless of their infection status. We're, um, at at this stage in New Zealand, we have poor services for young people with similar conditions and the current services are not equitable. One person with this group of conditions will be given a, a, a medical diagnosis, someone else will be told they have a psychosomatic illness and another group of people will be labelled truants and followed up by the truancy services. Uh, so I think it's really important when we're thinking about planning post-COVID clinics and support services that they shouldn't be limited to only to those who've had a positive test and they shouldn't be short-term. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you so much, Raywin. Um, so thanks to all of our presenters. I'm aware that we are in our break time, um, but I think what we're going to do is invite Mona, who's been facilitated in the session, just to um, give us one or two really brief questions, and then we're going to shorten the break to five minutes and make up some time later in the day. So, Mona. Yeah, no, thanks, Nick, and many thanks to all of you who gave really interesting um, presentations. There's been a lot of questions, um, just uh, and comments as well. A, a very pertinent one um, in the 2015 Te Puni Kokri report, the authors wrote, the wide ranging but interrelated whānau improvements emphasise the importance of holistic and integrated whānau driven approaches that are underpinned by cultural realities. How is it that GPs are disinterested in this phenomenon, the lived experiences of Māori or other people suffering long COVID? What is in their education that is maintain maintaining this distancing? Um, I'm not certain that needs a response, but I just think it's something we all need to keep in the forefront of our mind. A number of questions for Paula relating to the um, 
the lack of or the, the distinction between chronic illness and disability, uh, how ME has never been um, recognised in the disability sector. And I think that, uh, that Paula is answering some of those questions online. Um, and uh, there's a yeah, question to Raywin about uh, long COVID in babies and the relationship between uh, long COVID and ME in children. So if anyone wants to join in for a two minute conversation to answer those, feel free, but otherwise I think we'll perhaps leave it there and uh, have a quick break and come back at 11.45. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mina. That was a really good summary of some of the things that are coming up in the chat. And thank you to our presenters for engaging with those in the chat box. Um, so I think we're going to move to a break. Um, we'll come back at 11.45 sharp. Um, and I look forward to um, seeing you all then. Kia ora koto. Welcome back, everybody. Um, really sorry about the very shortened break there, but we are getting through an amazing programme of people. So I'm delighted to, uh, to share this next session. This is session four, Best Practice for Early Intervention and Support. We've got a whole range of speakers and I'd like to welcome uh, Michael Baker to uh, start us off. As most of you will have heard Michael Baker in the uh, over the past couple of years, if you hadn't heard of him before. He's a professor of public health, a very eminent infectious disease epidemiologist from the University of Otago. So welcome, Michael. Yeah, well, kia ora koto, and uh, thank you so much to the organisers for inviting me along. And uh, uh, also just a remarkable programme, really covering the breadth and depth of this topic. And I think the level of interest in terms of people engaging with this gives some idea of the concern that many New Zealanders have about this condition. So... I've been asked to talk about previous pandemics and post-viral syndromes. And of course, it's vital to learn from the past because often that's a great clue to what the future holds. So today, I just want to talk about three things. Uh, one is that most infectious diseases cause long-term conditions. And uh, we've got a term syndemics, which is the idea of the overlap between uh, infections, long-term conditions, and also the social determinants, which are very important. And this, these features apply whether it's a sporadic infectious disease or a pandemic disease. The, um, when we look at these long-term conditions, they split into ones that I think you could say are well understood. And we could look at something like paralytic polio as an example. And then, of course, we have the less understood conditions, post-acute COVID-19 syndrome, and this whole collection of conditions called post-acute infectious syndromes. And I, I think the third point I want to make today is that from a public health perspective, um, when you're confronted with this kind of spectrum, it's really important to minimize uh, the burden of these infections that have the, with, with pandemic viruses. Because of course, the more people who get infected, the more the consequences. And particularly when we don't know how severe the consequences are, we need to be cautious. So that's the precautionary principle. So I'll just expand on these three points. And the first one is this idea of syndemics. This is the, the idea of interacting co-present or sequential diseases. And this is a concept that started in anthropology. It's come across into epidemiology and public policy. And um, I thought it was very interesting when the editor of the uh, Lancet, Richard Horton, said, COVID-19 is not a pandemic, it's a syndemic. And I think that suddenly people started to think about these interrelationships. So we've got infectious diseases, long-term conditions, and I think the term overlaps with non-communicable diseases as well. And we've actually set up a program at uh, the University of Otago funded by the Health Research Council that we set up just before COVID started. This is the syndemic management of the biology and treatment of infections and chronic conditions. So that's symbiotic. And we've also have a, another um, program with a lot of collaborators uh, looking at um, uh, the COVID-19 research collaboration. So I think a lot of these ideas are getting very well established in, uh, in this field. So when we look at um, this area in terms of what we mean by this interaction between acute infections and long-term conditions, we have these multiple pathways. So if you get an infection, it has all these things it can do to you, tissue damage, inflammation, autoimmune diseases, and these other processes here that are often not well understood. So that contributes to long-term conditions, 
long-term conditions also predispose you to infectious diseases. And a single infection also predisposes you to other infections. And then, of course, the treatment for infections, and we think of intensive care, for example, can also predispose you to long-term conditions and vice versa. And all of these activities are embedded in a system where we have risk and protective factors and determinants. So, sorry, this is a very long list of things, but this is just a very short, in fact, a very short list of all of the ways in which infections result in long-term conditions. And we're doing a lot of work on something like um, group A strep causing acute rheumatic fever, and even something like that, that we've known about for decades, it's still poorly understood exactly how that happens. The main cause of stomach cancer in New Zealand is actually a, an infection, H. pylori. We've got all these viral infections that cause a range of long-term conditions. And pandemic diseases, all of them have long-term tails of varying intensities. And post-influenza syndrome, I think is getting a lot more attention now, long flu. It is a real phenomenon and it is relatively common, but under-researched. Uh, so I'm just going to look at polio for a moment because I think it has some really interesting lessons for us. So this was a disease that came in um, a series of um, uh, worldwide epidemics that touch New Zealand, and you get some years you get a thousand cases in New Zealand. But in fact, for every one of those cases, there was a hundred people infected. So over time, this infected the whole population in a series of waves. And one of the things is this virus is, is very transmissible. Uh, it creates um, asymptomatic infection in most people or mild febrile illness with gastroenteritis. And then it has two consequences. One is quite well recognized, of course, paralytic polio, it's such a dramatic presentation, it's caused by this infection. And it's only 1% of cases roughly or less actually. But then there's a syndrome that is, is not well recognized and that is post polio syndrome. And this has come on uh, decades later and affects you know, 25 to 50% of people who had this acute severe infection. And this is a reminder to be, I think, very humble and, and very open to the range of potential consequences of COVID-19 because it's a multi-organ uh, disease. And we may not see some of the consequences for decades. So just we need to be wary about that. So again, another very busy slide. This is actually a paper that's just come out in Nature Medicine, which I found particularly helpful. And that lists a, a long, it's got a long list of pathogens and the fact that they have post-acute infectious syndromes, not all of them have names. And when we look at them, one of the things these authors did that I think it's, it's well worth looking at this paper, they said actually there's a constellation of, of symptoms and signs that are common to all of these conditions, except for some that are trigger specific. So some that are unique to certain uh, pathogens, but the rest of them will be very well known to people who have experienced these conditions and studied them. Um, I just want to briefly mention uh, ME and CFS. Um, finally, these conditions got uh, have had more recognition in the last few years, and we know that um, the bulk of the of people with these uh, syndromes do report an infection beforehand, and it's commonly EBV or glandular fever is the most frequently identified triggering event, and it's got this constellation of um, symptoms that overlap very much with what we're talking about today, and. New Zealand had a, a big moment with this when it had Tapanui flu in 1984, which was recognized really as being part of this complex. Uh, and the society in, in Australia and New Zealand recognizes perhaps we have 25,000 people living with this condition, some for decades, and it can be very, really debilitated. And I really want to pay tribute to Professor Warren Tate and Dr. Rosamond Bellings, who have worked courageously for decades on this condition, these conditions with not a great deal of um, support, I think, from the research community. So um, one of the other areas we need to look at in terms of learning from history, of course, are the, the other coronaviruses, SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV-1. And so we know um, these um, have caused um, uh, uh, outbreaks um, of varying scale, but relatively small, obviously tiny compared with what we're seeing at the moment with COVID-19. But uh, SARS has certainly had some uh, study and it has been identified that um, some survivors do have um, persistent symptoms that overlap with uh, the long COVID syndrome we're talking about um, today. And I think we can learn from that experience that some of these symptoms are still disabling many years later. So 
finally, I just want to make the point that uh, we should not in any way regard the Omicron variant as a benign virus. Um, if we think about mortality in New Zealand, it's been responsible for most of the deaths in New Zealand, probably approaching 1,000 deaths, and we only had 50 prior to Omicron. So the reason it's so dangerous is it's so infectious and it's so good at reinfecting people, and it's resulting in perhaps half the country being exposed to this virus. And it's actually its infection fatality risk is the same as the first variant that swept around the globe for a year. And we know there are so many unresolved questions here um, at the moment. So I get very concerned when, we, when this is described as a mild infection. So just looking at this from a public health perspective, we had almost two years of elimination, which kept um, uh, the virus out of New Zealand for most of the time. We switched to a suppression approach with the Delta variant it was actually working very well at keeping exposure very low in New Zealand. And obviously with Omicron, it's changed hugely. We've moved to a mitigation approach. Uh, and just looking at um, what the consequences of these different approaches are, this is showing uh, cumulative mortality over time. And countries in the Asia Pacific region all adopted elimination approaches, or many of them did, and that kept the virus out, it kept mortality very low. So that was a great success. But now what's happened with Omicron, um, we've, we're now joining the rest of the world and we've got the same levels or cumulative infection rates as most of the Western world here. So we're heavily exposed, but we avoided the mortality largely because we are highly vaccinated. But whether a vaccine will protect us from the morbidity is still an open question. It probably does provide some protective effects, but um, perhaps not as much as we would hope for. So just to, to conclude, uh, uh, these are the main points I want to make that most infectious diseases cause long-term consequences. Uh, we've got these post-acute infectious syndromes that are real but poorly understood. A pandemic is bad because it, in, its impact is enormous because it infects so many people, perhaps the majority of people, much more than small outbreaks and sporadic disease. And we appear to have an unusually high risk of long-term conditions, NCDs, post-acute infection syndromes with COVID. And how do we respond? Well, I think we have to reduce exposure to the causative organism. And I think at the moment, uh, this would favor a, a more suppression approach rather than mitigation in New Zealand. Reducing the consequences of exposure, that means vaccination, rapid treatment, and obviously improving treatment rehabilitation services. And I think we do need to do surveillance and research. This problem will be different in New Zealand to the rest of the world. And we do need our own studies here preferably um, high quality longitudinal studies. So you can really measure both the burden of disease, but also the, the benefits of effective interventions. And I just want to acknowledge I'm part of a, a, a great network of people who also have similar concerns. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Many thanks, Michael. I think that's given us a great, um, a great setting for us to, uh, to move forward from. I always uh, really enjoy listening to you. Uh, next pre uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Brian Betty. Again, many of you will know uh, Brian. He is a GP and also currently the Medical Director of the Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners. So good to hear from a GP's point of view. Welcome, Brian. Great. Excellent. Um, well, look, thanks for the opportunity to speak, and I'll keep this short and to the point. And I, I suppose we wanted to give a general practitioner point of view. I'm Medical Director of the Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners. I'm also a General Practitioner in Cannons Creek in East Paurua, the Paurua Union and Community Health Service, which are predominantly Māori and Pacific, 90% high needs. So to say that we've had an interesting time over the last six months, or in fact two years, is an understatement. I mean, frontline general practice has, I suppose, in most of the COVID and community cases that we've had to deal with, the uh, the, the close to a million has, has been dealing with the issue. And at one point over the last two to three months, we were getting 100 cases a day through into the surgery. So essentially all our resource went into COVID. And we had very, very little time for long-term um, treatment of conditions that we normally do, preventative conditions, or all those other things that general practice do. So we've been actually very, very squeezed. So what I'd like to do is just a couple of things. One is just give a perspective of the scale of general practice across the country and some of the issues we confronted, and then make a couple of comments about long COVID and I think the, the, the implications we potentially have here. So I'll just um, 
Here we go. So, so one of the things that, that, that I suppose is not understood about general practice, or I think is understood very poorly, is the size and the dispersed model that we've actually got. So there's actually 5,500 general practitioners working across the country and about 1,000 practices. Now, those practices are a range of um, high needs practices or NGO bodies, such as in Cannons Creek where I work, they're corporate and they're private, and they can be in very low cost access um, modes, what we call low cost access practices or non-low cost access practices. So it's a very, very dispersed group um, and essentially 96% of the population has signed up with general practice across the country. Now this is really relevant in a moment. Um, what actually happens with general practice, it is actually the first point of contact for the majority of healthcare in this country. Uh, there's 20 and a half million contacts with general practice over a 12 month period. Over the next five years, that's expected to grow to 23 million in an area that, that actually works at capacity. And this is really, really important, um, both for doctors, for nurses, for allied health. Um, there is very, very little extra capacity within the system, which is why we've seen such an impact of COVID over the last two years on the sector. One of my comments about general practitioners and what they actually do, I think we are specialists in uncertainty and undifferentiated medical conditions and mental health conditions. Remember 30%, and this is important, of presentations we have into general practice have a mental health component. So it's a very, very mixed picture we deal with and it's often undifferentiated. Which comes to, there has been a huge amount of concern amongst the general practitioner com community over long COVID and the potential impact of what actually happens over the next few months, over the next few years, or however long we are, we are faced with this. I was interested in Michael's talk that we see post-viral syndromes commonly in general practice. In fact, I worked in Australia prior to coming back to New Zealand, a place called Port Perry, it's sort of up towards the outback of South Australia for nine years in a practice there. And Ross River fever was something we commonly saw. And I saw a number of patients who had significant symptoms for up to two years after exposure to Ross River fever, which is mosquito borne. Um, so this is an absolute reality. However, I think one of the issues is the greyness of general practice that we're confronted with. And I want to make a really key point about this that often with patients, it is very um, difficult to unpack what's actually going on in the context of the biological presentation and the maybe anxiety or mental health issues that are going on and actually the influence of what we hear in the broader community. And we see this time and time again in practice where patients will actually present and this happens regularly. And, and again, I'm I need to get to where I want to get to with this, but this happens regularly where patients will present and say, well, look, um, I've, I've heard that this happens maybe with, with X, I've heard it on the media, I've heard of a thing, I'm feeling anxious about it, and I now have a headache or I feel fatigued or tired. So there's a real close interaction between how we feel and how we feel physically. And the common ones we often see, headache, fatigue, tiredness, lack of concentration, and we see that across a broad spectrum of what actually goes on. So when it comes to long COVID with that background of what is a very complex, diverse system of first contact with the health system across New Zealand, I think it is really, really important in the public discourse around long COVID that we are very, very targeted as to what we're saying and how we're saying it. Um, I think it is important as we move through this that those with genuine long COVID that is affecting functioning are given space within the system to have the appropriate treatment and follow-up, um, as opposed to the separation of those that may be having a high degree of anxiety about COVID and the potential for long COVID. There may be a tributation of symptoms, which is something we see quite often, and they fall into a, a, a grey area that becomes very unclear. So the problem with long COVID at the moment, it is very unclear. We all accept that. It is very ill-defined. We all accept that. My concern is the more we publicly raise our concerns about long COVID in either the media or through various bodies, 
that we raise the anxiety level in the population. And that is something we've actually seen with COVID itself, the amount of anxiety that's actually going on with COVID and that how that drives things. And I think this is poorly understood. And I think as clinical leaders, we need to be very, very careful about our public statements and very careful about globalising or, or, or spreading out in, in an undifferentiated way our messaging around long COVID. And that would be one of the pleas I would have because it puts an enormous amount of pressure on general practice. Um, I think there is an urgent place for obviously a lot more study into long COVID to define it, what it is, and also something which I think is really, really important here, the serology of long COVID. So we know a lot of patients uh, may not have been symptomatic for, for long COVID. We're seeing a lot in practice now that maybe rat tests and PCRs are not being done for mild or symptomatic patients, and they are avoiding it for a lot of, lot of reasons, and we are seeing this in practice. Um, so, so basic fundamental things like the serology of the antibodies. We know there's two classes of antibodies to the spike protein and to the nucleocapsid protein, and they indicate two different things. We start to need tools to actually ask the question, has someone been exposed to COVID in the past? It becomes a really important diagnostic paradigm, and I think this needs serious work and serious thought. So for those that may present with whatever we define as long COVID in the end and the symptoms of long COVID, we can start to maybe serologically define, is there a problem here or what, what, what's going on? Have they actually been exposed to COVID in the recent past um, as opposed to the vaccination? That separation becomes really, really important. As we move through this, apart from keeping, I think, the anxiety levels down in the population, we need to develop clear, consistent guidance on the diagnosis and the, the, the treatment options for long COVID. Most of the contact and the management will happen in general practice clinics. That is the reality. There is not the specialist workforce to, to cope with this if the 10% figure that has been touted at the moment is the reality. So again, with that, the challenge that is there within the system for what I said in the first part of this presentation, we have 1,000 practices across the country, 5,500 general practitioners, about 12,000 nurses, multiple allied health, it is how these messages around the clear, consistent guidance and clinical indicators for diagnosing and treating long COVID are developed and are consistently pushed out to the long to the front line. I, I, I see continually issues such as, and I won't name the public service departments to do this, who will put out a single email to a thousand practices or five and a half, a workforce of 20,000, and then turn around to me and say, why has no one taken notice of this? <laughs> um, and that is the danger we've got to. We've got to have strong, consistent messaging across the sector as we start to define this condition and we start to define what will happen moving forward in both the diagnosis and the guidance over treatment. Um, oh, sorry to know, interrupt, Brad. I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up in the interest sure. of time, please. Yeah. We know that um, an increase in consultation of long COVID will put pressure on all restretched and fatigued workforce. We need to be very, very careful in this. In conclusion, I'd say very honestly that we need to keep the anxiety levels down on low COVID as a sector. It is really, really important. We need lots of work on the diagnosis and the care guidance around the treatment of long COVID. And we need to think hard how that is consistently um, transmitted or put out to frontline general practice in the community across the country um, or down the track we will run into problems with what's happening here. So thanks very much, Mona. Well, many thanks for those insights and I think there's, uh, there's certainly a lot of chat going on but we are going to have to move on pretty swiftly to our next speaker who is uh, Nick. So uh, many um, Many welcomes to you. Um, you've already heard from uh, from Nicola Hayes, uh, who chaired an earlier session. She is the director of Centre for Person Centred Research at AUT. Uh, is also on the uh, the steering committee of this uh, this day. And she's going to speak to us about the psychosocial experiences of people with long COVID. Kia ora koutou. Um, thank you so much for having me, everyone. Um, I am. Um, um, I'm really grateful to be here today and I, my, my focus really is on the psychosocial experience of um, long COVID um, and 
I'm just going to reduce something awesome. Um, psychosocial experience of long COVID and particularly how we can learn from those to inform how we work with people. And I really just want to start by acknowledging um, Janine's um, presentation earlier on this morning, who really shared a very personal story with us. And I think it really has set the context for today and is a critical starting point for where we go um, next with long COVID. So thank you, Janine. Um, Felicity Callard and Elisa Perego um, from the UK refer to long COVID as a patient-made illness. They say there are strong reasons to argue that long COVID is possibly one of the first illnesses to be made through um, patients finding each other on social media. And they argue that these individual stories that were shared have become collective narratives which have been formative to the making of long COVID. And so I think what's really important about this is that whilst when we are talking about lived experience of people living with an already known category of illness, um, in this case, long COVID has really emerged as a category of illness because of what we've learned from these people. So in essence, we only really know what we know about long COVID because of the stories people have shared. And so just as this has been critical in the recognition of long COVID, um, it needs to continue to be something that is critical in our next steps in how we manage it. Research seeking to understand and learn from the lived experience of long COVID continues to multiply. These are just some of the examples of the literature that are out there. But as well as this, long COVID we know has impacted health professionals, researchers, scientists, psychologists and many others who themselves have also undertaken their own peer reviewed research and published that. So we also have this really rich accumulation of patient led research available to us to inform what we do. We've already heard a number of stories today um, from Janine, but also through Mona and Lynn's um, work that they have done with their study in Aotearoa. And there are several patterns that emerge when we look across this collective experience. Um, we've heard people talk about the significant disruption that comes from the ongoing symptoms such as fatigue, brain fog, shortness of breath. And these really have a significant disruption to people's life, impacting their ability to plan, make decisions, um, think about the future, take care of oneself, even at a really daily level, participate in social activities, work, do all of those things that are quite critical to how we see ourselves and our roles and responsibilities. People describe a roller coaster of symptoms and an uncertain illness trajectory. So one of these quotes here from some of the researchers, there's lots of relapses involved, which initially was very, very demoralizing because I would think I've turned a corner, I'm gonna get better. And then it would just suddenly get like two steps forward, three or four steps back. Engagement with health services has been fraught with people feeling ignored, abandoned, fobbed off and brushed aside as Janine has already shared from her own story today. This example here says, the past seven months have been so devastating to myself and my family. No one believed that COVID symptoms could last that long. I've had to argue with GPs to refer me to specialists. COVID clinics are not really accessible to sufferers and certainly in my experience, long COVID is not something that all GPs are happy to acknowledge. Added to this, strategies that people feel are intuitive, that routinely people use to manage their own health and wellbeing like physical activity are not as straightforward as one might hope. For example, I don't fully understand the balance of what might be a trigger. I'm terrified of an avalanche of chronic fatigue like I'm standing on the edge of a cliff with no control over when and if I will fall. Experiences of stigma and discrimination are common, both in people's engagement with health services, but also in interactions with family and friends and strangers. And collectively, these experiences contribute to a profound sense of impact on sense of self and identity. These stories highlight a pretty grave picture that long COVID has a significant and enduring social, psychosocial impact. Not only that, people's engagements with health services so far have exacerbated their trauma. 
To the extent that, as Janine's already said, people have felt gaslighted by their health professionals who are perceived to deliberately undermine their account of their illness. Iason and others um, who set up the COVID Recovery Collective in the UK have said, epistemic injustice is like a hot lava running through all the COVID-19 lived experience research, where clinicians did not recognize their condition, did not believe that it existed, did not know how to diagnose it, did not empathize or acknowledge their suffering and did not know how to manage it. They have said that when patients were not listened to, it created a missed learning opportunity for service delivery and for the healthcare profession. It had a significant impact on the care received and the healthcare system left people vulnerable. So my question is, how, are, how might we move from a health and social system which contributes to and exacerbates psychosocial trauma experienced by people living with long COVID to a health and social system which listens to and values lived experience and which bolsters psychosocial resources for navigating life in the context of long COVID. Drawing from the experiences of people with long COVID to date, and also from the research that we've carried out in other long-term conditions, there are several things we can do as a starting point. First, there's still so much to learn about long COVID, and so acknowledging, valuing, legitimizing the experience of people with long COVID is critical. In doing so, however, we do need to be mindful of the voices that are being heard, because even within the long COVID community, it's likely that some voices will be more dominant than others. So we already can see from the literature so far, for example, that in the qualitative research to date, the majority of people are white and female. So we need to make sure that we really draw on and invite a diverse range of perspectives to this. Second, we need to co-design clear, flexible, and accessible pathways of care for long COVID with a focus on equity and access, experience and outcome. Rushworth and colleagues have reflected on the UK experience and they talk about the NHS as being depicted as a stumbling character who had prepared for a different role, that of acute responder who was unable to adapt to the very different challenges of long COVID. They used words like random, lottery and luck to describe the attempts that people experienced when navigating health services. New Zealand is moving into a new phase of COVID and we need to avoid making the same mistakes. Thirdly, we need to treat every encounter with the health system as inherently psychosocial. In other words, every interaction that people have with our health and social care system has the potential to have psychosocial effects either negative or positive. So we need to design a system that bolsters people's psychosocial experience rather than one that is perpetuating or exacerbating their trauma. One way we can do this is by paying explicit attention to psychosocial experience and outcome and actively work in ways that build confidence, sense of self, cultural identity, all of these are core resources when people are navigating a com the complexity of a long-term condition. Fifth, we need to practice humility and intellectual candor. Elizabeth Malloy argues that health professionals need to maintain social status as expert can make it difficult for them to express vulnerability. She argues for what she calls intellectual candor as a way of managing this tension. We are all learning, and so we need to be honest about what we know and don't know and about the inherent uncertainties. And finally, we need to remain emotionally aware and reflexive. We can be at risk of avoiding emotions in practice, of skirting around these emotionally charged topics like uncertainty and fear. However, it's been argued that this can risk undermining our relationships with patients actively engaging with emotions is likely to contribute to more honest and trusting relationships. So in summary, um, navigating life in the context of long COVID is an inherently psychosocial process, which has profound impact on people's lives and things that matter to them. So far, interactions with health services 
have been exacerbating people's trauma. So we need to get to know, understand and value, first of all, the unique and particular experience of individuals so that we can meet people where they're at when they access health services. And secondly, we need to get to know and understand the collective experiences of the long COVID community so that we can co-design services which are responsive to their shared experience. There's increasing evidence that it's not just the absence of negative factors, but also the presence of positive factors that contribute to long-term outcomes. And so bolstering psychosocial resources such as confidence, choice and control, sense of self, cultural identity, may all be critical to people developing the psychological capability necessary to manage the complexity of long COVID. We have the opportunity to do things differently in New Zealand, to not repeat the mistakes that we've observed around the world. And we have the opportunity to design for a positive psychosocial experience and outcome from the outset. So I'm gonna leave you, I hope Janine doesn't mind this, um, with some words that Janine said earlier that I think are really apt. Um, we need to lead with open palms and open minds and open hearts. We need to ask, how can we help? Kainui te mihi kia katoa katoa. Um, thank you so much, Nick. That was a very beautiful and powerful um, presentation. I think you can tell from the level of, um, of the reactions that are floating up the screen at the moment. So many, many thanks and many apologies to you in advance for my lack of ability to, um, to chair a session to time, but I didn't want to cut you off. I thought that was fabulous. I would like to welcome now um, Wendy McRae. Uh, Wendy is a respiratory physician at Counties Manukau and is going to talk to us about uh, triaging in um, for a long COVID clinic in um, relation to multidisciplinary care. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you, and, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me. And I must say, I've really enjoyed this morning. I mean, I sometimes think sometimes we feel like we work in silos, and it's just been an absolute pleasure to actually just hear today and hear so many things that have echoed my own observations and experiences over the past couple of years working in this COVID space. So essentially today, I've been asked to talk to you about the post-COVID clinic that we have been running um, through Counties Manica for the past seven months. What I want to do is I want to talk about what we've done, what we've learned, and really what an effective post-COVID tertiary clinic um, could look like. Um, now, I realise our clinic may not tick every box that Janine and others have described us as needing, but I hope um, that you'll forgive me and realise that what we're doing is really just a start. But before, before I go forward, I really need to take you back to August um, last year. And there, within a matter of days, South Auckland found itself in the epicentre of New Zealand's Delta outbreak. And our service really found itself managing nearly all of the COVID acute um, cases in our hospital. And we were managing those in unfamiliar circumstances and negative pressure wards. Now, for those of you who might not be aware of anybody coming in from overseas, South Auckland's got a high proportion of Maori and Pacifica people. They face um, higher levels of economic deprivation, and traditionally they have been a much more difficult um, group to engage in healthcare services. And unfortunately, these were the very same people who were involved in this, the epicentre of our outbreak. So over that five months that followed the August um, exposure, our respiratory service admitted over 284 cases with respiratory, um, so obviously illness related to Delta virus. Over half of those patients actually required oxygen. A quarter of patients were severe enough that they needed to go into CPAP and over 10% of patients were admitted to the ICU. I was working acutely with these patients at the time and while the learning curve was really steep, what concerned me most was the fact that I was acutely aware that these people, while they may be acutely recovering from their major illness, they were going to need long-term follow-up, both from a physical and a psychological point of view. A lot of these patients had quite traumatic experiences and quite long hospital admissions. I was aware that our existing clinic um, did not either have the capacity or really the structures to see this whole new group of patients. Over sort of 90% of the patients we were seeing as inpatients were patients not known to our service at all that never previously presented under any sort of respiratory service. So I realised we had to do something. Um, there was nothing in place, so we basically just got on, re rearranged our workloads and started dedicating one day a week to our respiratory post-COVID clinic. And so since May, um, so since October last year, 
which was approximately six weeks after our first patient was discharged, we have um, continued to assess patients following the discharge from hospital. We've now seen over 141 um, patients through our clinic. We keep a really simple NDT team. So essentially there's the respiratory physician, who's myself. I work with a nurse practitioner and we work alongside a physiotherapist. Now the three of us um, also work within the better breathing and rehab space. These are people I'm used to working with. We know we work with compassion. We know we work in a very holistic um, manner. We're now linked in with a general physician um, who is seeing some of the more milder um, COVID cases discharged from hospital and is also seeing long COVID, um, which is being referred directly in from general practitioners. And as well as this, we work with some very obliging physiologists and we have a team of radiologists who have been very interested in COVID and its presentations um, throughout the time we've been dealing um, with this. So as far as our clinic format, again, we've tried to keep it as simple as we can. We're, we're trying to run a one-stop shop. And the reason for this is we're trying to make this as simple and accessible to people as possible. We aim to see people around for a sort of six to eight weeks after their discharge. And the reason we've chosen that time frame is by that stage, we're getting an idea about their recovery trajectory. And it's also a time when we can you know, quite quickly address any issues that may be arising. We can approve people or hold people off getting back to work. And we can start to provide some of the psychosocial support that a lot of these patients are going to continue to need. When patients come to clinic on that day, they get a chest x-ray. And for the majority of patients, we try and get lung function testing done as well. They then come forward and they have actually a joint assessment with the physician, either Nicola or myself, and as well as a physiotherapy assessment. We undertake some investigations and that's usually things such as six minute walk tests or five repetitions sit to stand. And then we all come together and we have um, discussion with the patient and often their family, we go over results and we make some plans either to direct them in the correct pathway as far as management going forward or talk to them about options with regard to further investigations and for a lot of patients if needed referral onto other specialist services. So over the time we've been seeing our patients, um, it's become clear that our patients do, for the majority, have ongoing symptoms. So if I can show you here, about 35% of patients are fully recovered. By the time they come back to us, they tell us that they're feeling fine and they're getting back to normal. So that's the minority of the group. Around 16% of patients still have persistent shortness of breath as their primary symptom. Some patients have around the same proportion have ongoing fatigue and also a lot of patients are still presenting with pain. So these are tertiary patients and a lot of them, even though they came in with respiratory problems are now representing with lots of pain, particularly in legs and lower back. When we look at these patients in general though, um, Around 56% of patients can be discharged back to their primary care physician. But that still leaves 44% of these patients who do require some sort of tertiary follow-up. So for a proportion of these patients, we actually see them back in the post-COVID clinic. We have capacity to continue to follow them up. A large number of other patients we actually send through to other services which come under our respiratory umbrella. So that may be a sleep clinic um, for management of sleep disorder breathing, a better breathing um, service, or um, dysfunctional breathing, which I know we're going to be talking about um, later on today. So essentially a range of uh, other services is where we refer people to. There are distinct groups of patients. Now I've put these here as four different groups, but what I want to make clear is that some patients do fit into more than one category. There is a proportion of patients who are fully recovered, but and despite that, they actually still find, well, I hope, the clinic to be both um, sort of beneficial and in some ways reassuring. And these are probably the group of anxious patients, um, which Brian has just alluded to. So for these people, we're st still able to reassure them, make sure that they're back to work and encourage them towards full vaccination. There's a group of patients who do have pomni sequelae. This is the group of patients we, I suppose, we're comfortable looking after. We're respiratory physicians, and these are patients who we've been expecting to continue to follow up through our services. More difficult is the patients who do have the, the non pulmonary sequelae. So for a lot of these, it's that chronic pain patients, the ones with long COVID, the fatigue, the brain fog. And as mentioned, a lot of our patients, like 15% of patients through our service, have quite significant dysfunctional breathing. The other group is this patients with comorbidities. And I don't think we should underestimate, particularly in some of the populations that we're dealing with, the role of these comorbidities. 
And certainly I, for one, would really struggle to diagnose long COVID fatigue in somebody who clearly has untreated severe sleep disordered breathing or poorly controlled diabetes. So I think sometimes until we can look in and manage these comorbidities, it's really hard to make a clear diagnosis for a lot of these patients of long COVID. So we really take the perspective as we want to uncover anything we can because we want to be able to offer patients as much treatment as they can. And like I said, for a lot of these patients, this is the first time they've ever received um, this sort of level of care. So what have we learned? I'm hoping um, our patients have been grateful for the opportunity to attend a post-COVID clinic. Um, and even those who can't attend in person, we're really hoping that the phone calls that we make out towards them is received um, very beneficially. We know that patients having their experiences and ongoing symptoms validated is really important to them. We simply take the time we're there and we're listening to them. We find that it's a real benefit to actually see people in person. And particularly after a lot of these patients have been through our acute service where we were so masked up, we were so covered in PPE, it was very difficult to get that face-to-face -face, um, holding the hands, the sort of thing that we really want to do to show some sort of connection with our patients. So being seen face-to-face, -face, they can see their results and they can work with people like physiotherapists face-to-face. We think it's really important not to focus on time frames, particularly when other people in their families or other colleagues may have got better from COVID really quickly. For us, it's really about staying optimistic with these people, seeing some, hopefully, some um, ongoing progression. And for a lot of these patients, we're seeing ongoing progression for the seven months we've been following them. Every month, they are getting better. So just finally, I just want a couple of things. When we're thinking back as to what, an, um, what the schema of what our post-COVID clinic looks like, Ultimately, at the center of all this are our patients. And I think for every, for every DHB, for every group, we have to look at the sort of patients that we're looking at. And so we can actually tailor our clinics a lot more specifically. So here we're sitting in the middle, but we're taking referrals, obviously still from our inpatient services, but a lot of referrals are now coming from primary care, just asking us to get involved with the, the, the care of these patients. We have a very... Um, sort of bi-directional relationship with both Better Breathing and our HBS services. Right now, I'm actually electing to assess all of these direct referrals through to these services in our post-COVID clinic. And the reason for that is we really want to make sure that these patients have access to the investigations and the tertiary care assessments that they need. And then once they've been assessed, then they are actually directly put back into Better Breathing and HBS services. As mentioned, um, we have good links with radiology and a lung function laboratory. And now we're starting to build these links with these other services. And honestly, my ideal is that within each of these services, there is a clinical lead. There's somebody who's interested in COVID within each of these services who will put their hand up, be able to be addressed directly, and hopefully then facilitate that patient's transfer sort of quickly with some sort of degree of priority into these um, other services. What we really don't want to do is to have patients on sequential long wait lists. These patients have been sick acutely, and we know that there are things that we can do. And that I think the sooner we address issues, the better. But just my final slide, it really, I mean, just putting together everything that we've been talking about. So timely and rapid access, I think we've all been talking about that today, we have to get on, we have to do something. We want our services to be patient-centred, and certainly for many of our patients, we had real issues with engaging them, and so we as clinicians were taking the time to ring patients directly to book in and negotiate clinic appointments, to work out times, to work out transport arrangements so they could actually come into the clinic. We were arranging food parcels and other things for these patients simply because we were the only people seeing them. We want it to be equitable and really accessible to any, any groups of patients. Our clinics have to be non-judgmental. So even at this time, when I've looked back at the patients we've seen, over 20% of our patients are still not vaccinated. So this is a very difficult group to sometimes engage with. It's not my job to judge them. My job, I believe, is simply to try and engage them and to educate them. We've talked about the services being integrated, it has to flow smoothly and also collaborative. I mean, I, all the work I do is in a collaborative MDT settings. I think we work so much better in teams. We share our knowledge, we share our skills and our experience, but I think importantly, we take more risks when we're working with others. And simply, I think it makes the job, which is right now quite difficult, it makes it more enjoyable for working with other like-minded people. And importantly, COVID's not going away. Our clinics need to be sustainable. It's no point putting forward a model which you know gets falls, falls over at the next funding round. And my final point is that our clinics, they, they can be, they have to be simple. 
we don't need to be running clinics with clinicians from five or six different disciplines all sitting in one space. Not every patient needs that sort of wraparound multi-level care. A lot of our patients just have one or two issues that need to be addressed quite acutely. We need to start small. We need to make links of the make use of the links that we've got around us. And my final point is we don't have a choice. We have to start meeting the needs of our patients. And I believe that something um, is better than nothing. Thank you. Many thanks, Wendy. That was really inspirational. And um, again, apologies for to, to, to the other leaders for, for not um, not cutting you off. I thought that was that was too good to stop. Uh, I think there's some fantastic work that's going on. It's really encouraging to hear the approach you're taking, and I'm sure many people listening to this um, will feel the same. I would now like to introduce our last speakers for this session. Um, uh, this is uh, Alan Pithy and, uh, and Leah Hatley. Alan is an infectious disease physician, and Leah. Uh, a registered nurse and she, Leah, is leading the return to work team at Canterbury DHB. So really interesting to hear um, the work that you've been doing in terms of, as your slide there says, supporting people working, uh, returning to work uh, following, uh, following COVID-19 illness. Welcome. Hi, uh, kia ora koutou everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting us to this, uh, what's turned out to be absolutely fascinating uh, uh, symposium and really important. Um, our presentation is a little bit different, I think, um, because we are um, not so much focusing on long COVID, but actually trying to support our colleagues in the recovery acutely from COVID. And so we're just going to describe uh, the process that we've set up. Um, and we really welcome feedback, actually. So next slide, please. Yeah. So the CDHB, Canterbury District Health Board, is the biggest employer in the South Island. We have over 11,000 staff. <coughs> Uh, we, uh, like all health systems, have been quite uh, concerned about uh, the impact on COVID on our capacity to care, particularly on uh, 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 not only in the patients presented to hospital, but actually on our, our own healthcare workers and the impact like they have on them. So we know from overseas experience that staff will mainly require COVID outside of work and equivalent rates to the rest of the community. And uh, we know from overseas experience that up to five to 10% of staff could be affected by COVID at any one point. Um, overseas experience demonstrates delayed recovery from COVID. And we've, we've heard about that a lot today, um, but certainly up to 50% of individuals in some studies and some studies even greater. Uh, however, we have a fully vaccinated workforce, of course, and Omicron is the dominant viral strain. And that raises some doubt about what we might experience. So we set about developing a programme to support uh, staff back to work. Our principle was that early recognition interventions likely offered the best prospect for time recovery. So uh, we set up a return to work programme. Uh, return to work programme is uh, actually managed by Leah sitting beside me. Uh, uh, she is a clinician, but also supported with non uh, uh, clinical support team who focus on providing support and guidance to staff on their recovery. And, and principally, uh, it's very much focused on helping staff get back to work when they feel well enough to do so. So it's early intervention. This uh, slide just demonstrates our experience of the number of staff we have off with COVID acute at any point in time. And you can see here, we, we did model our red line was what we predicted. Uh, we predicted that we would peak with 525 staff would be off at one point, which is roughly 5% of our, our workload, uh, our workforce. Um, and we thought we were doing really well, of course, when we got to 463 and 469. Thought, yes, we're on the downhill slope, but of course, there's been rather a long uh, uh, downhill uh, journey. And currently, uh, uh, well, this one was taken the 23rd of May. You can see we've still got about 150 staff off at the moment of COVID. Now, this is acute and, and long term. So I'm now going to hand over to Leah, who's going to talk about the actual uh, return to work uh, programme and, and where this is where this is going. Yeah, thanks Leah. Kia ora everyone. So um, 
Thank you, Alan. So um, Return to Work as a team was established in late February as a part of the Omicron response here in Canterbury and West Coast with our Emergency Coordination Centre and was really strongly support, uh, supported by our executive leadership team. So it was modelled off a COVID-19 staff support programme in Australia, and it's an opt-in process for staff. So we know that we haven't captured all of our staff through this process, um, but it is here for staff if they need support during um, their COVID journey. It's guided by our return to work flowcharts, and there's an example of one just to the right there for those who have tested positive. Um, with um, our setup of our program, it's really important to recognise that we had multiple teams and individuals that were involved in the setup of this. So, from our CDHB data team, who um, were essential in building the safe storage and then helping to report through to us and return to work of health information for employees, and our CDHB privacy officer involved in this process as well to ensure correct oversight. Um, and then, of course, we've had the likes of Ellen and the um, technical advisory group um, helping with the um, development of our return to work processes for staff. This is just, um, I suppose I'm trying to get across, it's bigger than just the return to work team. Um, so we have four categories for staff registration, um, those who have tested positive for COVID-19, household contacts, exposure at work, and then we also have mildly symptomatic staff but testing negative. So this is our current process for those who have tested positive. And before I go into it in a little bit more detail, it's just quite good to note that um, this process was obviously set up before the return to work advice from the Ministry of Health for Healthcare Workers was um, made available. Um, but it was good to note that we were actually working within the parameters of that. So staff can register either via our online um, form, which is made available externally and internally to staff. Um, or they can call us directly, which a lot of staff do, because um, we're quite a nice team, I think, sometimes, <laughs> so it's quite good. Um, and then also, they'll then get a call on day three of from their day zero. Um, the day three call is quite important because that's when we check in with staff to make sure that they have supports at home, and also includes us asking, you know, do they actually have food in the cupboards, and do they have someone checking in on them, um, do they have access to um, prescriptions, because because we do find that some staff don't. And so we're able to provide them with community numbers for them to um, be able to access community supports. We also make sure that they understand our return to work flow charts. Some people may have just seen that there are, um, we're up to version 27. So information did change quite rapidly in the early, um, in April, especially right in the early piece in March. Um, so we make sure that they're happy with the process of what's going on. And then also that they've been in touch with their manager. Um, from there, we give them a call on day seven um, because we want to make sure that people are feeling okay and well enough to return to work. This process is about making sure people are well enough. So um, being realistic, um, we want to make sure as well that people aren't feeling pressured to return back to work when they're not well enough. This is all about putting the employee at the centre of this process, and sometimes we do intercede on their behalf if they're not feeling like they can speak to their managers if they're unwell, um, and it's about making sure people have a voice and understand um, that it's okay to be unwell as well. Um, if people are fine, they're back to work at day eight. Our process includes that if you're back at work at day eight, you wear a N95 mask at day eight, nine, and 10. Um, and then if people are still unwell, then we will call them again at day 10. Um, and then they'll be back at work at day 11 if they're well enough. You'll see that there is a care of manager group off to the side. So for our staff who do have ongoing symptoms and are unwell, um, this is the current process where we um, will talk to the person's manager with their consent and we will advise the manager that they have ongoing symptoms and will need ongoing um, leave. 99% of our um, staff are working with their GPs at this stage because of their ongoing symptoms um, and they will need more time off. Um, and the manager then continues the, the fantastic work of checking in of the employee and making sure that they've got the wraparound support that they need. Um, 
we get a lot of questions around pay and what people are entitled to from managers and from staff. Um, we're almost a, a little bit of a navigation service for a lot of people. So it's making sure that um, people know what they're entitled to. People have a voice if they need a voice and making sure that people feel like they have someone in their corner sometimes as well. Yeah. So if I move quickly on to by the numbers, um, so we have over, we've had over three and a half thousand registrations with return to work and two and a half thousand of those have been positive. Really interesting for us early on in the piece, we did note that um, we had a big proportion of staff that weren't well enough to return to work at day eight. Um, and the leadership also recognised that and worked incredibly hard so that we would retain our seven day isolation and wellness period for our staff so that they could stay at home to recover. And our ECC staffing team um, did a phenomenal job working across the system to retain that. Um, yeah, I'll just. So what does this mean going forward in the changing, I suppose, landscape of we're now seeing staff who are calling up, asking for support for return to work, who are now four, six, eight weeks down the track and still not back at work. They're working with their managers, they're working with their GPs, but they're still unable to return to work due to the shortness of breath, fatigue, headaches. Um, we know that the symptoms have been covered here today. Um, and we know from the literature that's out there on healthcare workers, um, Alan would I'm sure speak to that, but we know that there will be an impact on our healthcare workers going forward for um, the long-term effects. So this is awaiting um, approval at this point in time, but this is what we're um, hoping that will um, be approved, that return to work will be extended to working with staff until day 30. Um, and from there, if the individual um, wishes, they can then work with our illness management team um, to continue their recovery. Um, occupational health will also be involved more um, actively throughout the journey if required. Um, really importantly, though, the GP will still remain in charge of the clinical care. Um, this is about involving an MDPT approach to returning to work and in, um, providing as much support as possible for people on their journey um, with COVID and recognising that we have two streams of staff as well. We have our staff who have come through return to work, that's an opt-in process, and our staff who have potentially gone back to work um, and have then become um, unwell again because their symptoms have flared up and so then they're off work so three three streams sorry and so then we've also got the people who have not come through return to work and have been unwell and have ongoing symptoms so making sure everyone's got support that needs support um, yeah, this is also waiting to have an equity lens and accessibility lens placed over it. So we just want to make sure we get it as right as possible um, for our staff. Yeah, I think that's really all I've got to say. Have you got any final words, Ellen? No, thanks very much, Leah. <laughs> and nothing really except to say that, as Lee pointed out, it is a work in progress. Um, and as we're learning, of course, the, the whole process is, is shifting. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Oh, many thanks to you both. Um, what a fantastic initiative. I'm sure there's a lot of people who wish they worked at Canterbury or West Coast. Uh, superb to hear you supporting your staff in that way. And hopefully this is a model that might potentially be rolled out to other employers as well. So we've come to the end of this session. We are running quite, of, uh, quite late. So I'm afraid we're not going to answer live questions now. Um, but as, uh, as has been noted in the chat, then we will be uh, asking the um, the panellists to answer questions uh, and those will be made available to you. So we're going to stop now for a lunch break. It's going to be really short. I'm afraid we are going to start again at one o'clock as planned. So for those of you coming back, that's 12 minutes to rush off, get yourself something to eat and stretch your legs. And we'll look forward to seeing you again very shortly. Mm -hmm.